I have been in this industry for 24 and a half years. You know, it was understood that we came in to do a job and we weren't there to get laid. You are not allowed to date the models. The rise of OnlyFans, did it disrupt the adult industry? And making money independently and didn't have to rely on the brands to for their paycheck. They could now make money on their own. Essentially, people became independent entrepreneurs in a way that they weren't before. Does sex sell? Men are obsessed with their penis size. They're obsessed with, is it big enough? Is it too small? Is it okay? What do I do with it? I think they intrinsically think, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. So if they're just straight on and you got a lot of butt cheek here, you know, you're not seeing anything. They have to kind of like twist themselves in a way to open themselves up to camera. Tell my mom about, you know, the day that ended so wonderfully because I was able to clean up, come off the couch and she can say, oh, I'm so proud of you, honey. What a mother and daughter conversation. Just before we get into this madness, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. Holly, are you the Quentin Tarantino of the adult industry? Oh my gosh. I wish I could say that, though I have to say I used to shoot a lot of foot fetish stuff back in the day for various uh, adult magazines when those existed. But um, I would say that there's a lot of directors out there who are probably at least more celebrated than I am. And are you just a director or are you more <laughs> of an entrepreneur? Uh, I love, I like that word entrepreneur. It just encapsulates so much more. So I will say like specifically in the adult industry, almost nobody is just a director because we work with pretty small crews and our budgets aren't anything compared to the mainstream industry. So if you're a director, you're also a producer with all of the different producer jobs that comes along with it. Um, I also shoot the photographs on set. Uh, I also do the budgeting. Um, I do the payments. You know what? I mean, I also am kind of a PA too. I will clean the come up off the couch if that needs to be done. I will do whatever it takes to get the job done. So director's just one of the hats that I wear. So when you're cleaning come off the couch, are you thinking I've really arrived in my life as an entrepreneur? <laughs> You know what? Yes, because that come on the couch means the scene got done. The guy got hard. The guy finished and uh, and it's a wrap. So, yes, I feel very accomplished in that moment. And is it not always a given that those things that you said would happen? You know, because, look, I am obviously have no knowledge of this industry whatsoever. Um, but whatsoever. I, I can imagine it's a lot harder than people would imagine. And it's pretty tough work being on set so to, to get the rap to get the shot the scene the film is it a lot of hard work is it difficult it depends um it depends on the talent the talent is a huge part of the equation so and it depends on the scene it depends on how complicated it is it depends on what the client's asking for i mean i've had to do some ridiculous scenes like i once had to shoot a two girl anal strap on scene with angel wings in a bathtub. Now that's so complicated for a lot of reasons. The angel wings were really problematic and always like got in the way and was blocking the shot and like kind of coming off. I don't know if you've ever had sex in water, but that's also difficult. Lubrication thing's an issue. Um, anal is, you know, another element that makes things more complicated. And uh, a strap-on is also not always ideal because if it doesn't fit right, if it doesn't um, stay straight, uh, the girl obviously can't feel what's happening. There's a lot of like elements that make a scene like that incredibly hard to shoot. Um, and then when it comes to boy-girl, yeah, I mean, so much of it depends on the guy, right? The guy, like the weight of the entire scene is on the guy's shoulders. So... Yes, um, I tend to be selective about the men that I use for the scenes that I shoot because uh, sometimes they just can't finish the scene. I, I end up not cleaning come up off the couch at the end of the day and that is that is not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so what makes good talent? You know, when you say you, there's certain guys that you make pick, what makes good talent? 
So they would be, you know, obviously um, fit the scene. So, you know, attractive in shape, not only just aesthetically, but also these guys are athletes, honestly, like they have sex for long periods of time in very uncomfortable positions under, you know, sometimes very excruciating conditions. It's like freezing or it's really hot or they're on an incredibly uncomfortable surface. So, um, they just mostly have to be able to perform with all of those variables in play. And it is not an easy job to do. It is not an easy job to be able to turn your mind off to all of those extenuating circumstances and be able to, you know, get sexually excited in a situation, which is not necessarily a sexually exciting situation and to be able to keep yourself hard for extended periods of times with stops and breaks and lighting rechanges. And the key is to be able to come on cue. That's actually one of the harder things. And um, not every guy can do that. So there's a lot of things that come together to make like the perfect male porn star. Do you think that sex and intimacy is somewhat ruined for people in the adult industry? I think it varies from person to person, but I would imagine that you become a little bit jaded. I mean, when it's your job, uh, it can take some of the mystery out of it. So I've heard some performers say that I actually had a girl on my podcast the other day who was talking about how her, her boyfriend is also a performer husband actually, and how they don't get to have sex with each other as often as they would like, because they're tired from having sex with other people. So um, I think that that can definitely come into play for sure. How do they not get jealous? That's a great question. Uh, some couples do, uh, some couples don't. Um, I think that most people can understand that it's a job and they can separate sex and love, you know, intimacy and performance. Um, but I think other people struggle with that. So it's different for each person. I don't know much about your personal life and if I hit the line, just slap me. But are you, um, have you ever been like intimate as in, in a relationship or married with someone in the adult industry yourself? No, uh, I have been in this industry for 24 and a half years and I have never, ever been with a performer. And for me, it was really about professionalism. I don't think it's a professional thing for a director to sleep with talent. I understand that sometimes people fall in love and you know, you can't help that. But for me, I always maintain that professional distance. It's a job. I come in here to do the job. I don't date the talent. And uh, so no, I never have. Um, was that a clear decision because of professionalism or because you thought there might be the sex and intimacy and jealousy issues? It was really just a professional decision. And I think it was something that my mother instilled in me. You know, it was understood that we came in to do a job and we weren't there to you know, get laid. And that was, that's something that I have to also reiterate with my assistants and my crew as well. Like you are not allowed to date the models. Like you are not allowed to ask them out. You are not allowed to ask for their number. I very much discourage it because there also can be like a very tricky power dynamic that comes up. You know, there's been issues in the past where, you know, models have slept with directors because they thought that it was going to get them ahead in their line of work. And, you know, it, it, it gets, messy. And I don't ever want to have to tell a client, oh, I can't work with that person because I banged him once and like things got weird, you know? So I, I very much keep that, that professional distance. You talked about um, your mum. What do they think of you being in this industry? Um, well, you asking that question suggests to me that you don't know about how I got into the industry. No, I do. Uh, sometimes I ask okay. and I don't know. And sometimes I do. Um, and in okay. this, this instance, I do, because I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, my mother is Suze Randall, who, uh, you know, was kind of one of the pioneers for women behind the camera in the adult industry. And my father has been her partner and her business partner, um, for like 50 years now. So they really worked together, uh, the entire time that my mom was working in the adult industry. And, you know, I mean, obviously 
I started working for them and then I went off on my own. So, you know, they're, they're very proud of me. And, um, it's definitely, for me, it's not an issue. My family is fully accepting of what I do for a living and I can come home and tell my mom about, you know, the day that ended so wonderfully because I was able to clean up, come off the couch and she can say, Oh, <laughs> I'm so proud of you, honey. <laughs> what a mother and daughter conversation. <laughs> yeah. Think- we have, uh, some unusual conversations for sure. Mm. Do you think that some people in the industry, it sort of ostracizes them from their family or there's difficulty there? Absolutely. I've talked to quite a few people who've, you know, been disowned by their parents, have been completely cut off from their family because of what they do for a living. And it's really sad. And I feel like those are the performers that I see struggle the most with mental health issues because they don't feel like anybody has their back. Um, They don't feel like they have like a safe place, a community, people who love them for who they are, who've known them, you know, their entire lives. And that's where I see um, the most, the most strain, the performers who have uh, parents and family members who accept them for what they do seem to fare much better in the industry. Holly, does sex sell? Hmm, I don't know. Uh, I would say probably, I don't know. I feel like the way that sex is portrayed in mainstream and how, you know, prolific porn and recession proof porn has been for these past many decades, uh, I would say probably. I actually had a question about if the adult industry is recession proof. I'd love to talk about that. What makes it recession proof and how did it adapt through things like lockdown? Because that must have changed it quite a lot. Definitely. I think, you know, it's kind of like, I guess you could count it as like one of those vices that people turn to when um, they're feeling down or lost their job. Uh, You know, it's something that helps them to escape reality. And uh, porn has generally done very well during recessions and hasn't really been affected by it. COVID specifically changed the adult industry dramatically because of the rise of the OnlyFans platform and, you know, camming as well, but really OnlyFans was what took off during COVID. And what we saw from that was this indication that people really desired connection with other people because what OnlyFans provided that other platforms at the time, like, you know, generic websites that you would visit didn't was a one-on-one connection with your favorite performer. So OnlyFans enables you to DM, direct message your performer, they DM you back, you request custom content, they send you photos, et cetera, et cetera. It kind of feels like having a virtual girlfriend or boyfriend. And during COVID, when so many people were in lockdown and weren't able to see other people, weren't able to go out and be social, they really turned to these platforms for comfort and for connection. And so you just saw you know, that platform just exploded. Do you think um, there was a downside to the rise of OnlyFans? Did it disrupt the adult industry in other ways? I don't think so, though. I do know that other performers, or sorry, other producers and directors kind of complained when we came back that a lot of performers who, you know, were now doing really well on OnlyFans and making money independently and didn't have to rely on the brands to, for their paychecks, you know, didn't have to shoot for the big studios to make money. They could now make money on their own. Essentially people became independent entrepreneurs in a way that they weren't before. And there were some complaints that, you know, some of the bigger stars, the girls who were making more money, weren't coming to set. They weren't showing up. They, you know, didn't want to do these studio shoots anymore. They preferred to create their own content, which they owned and were able to monetize on their own. But I personally think it was a good thing because now the people who come to set are the people who really want to be there, right? Really want to shoot for the studios. They enjoy the interactiveness of like a big set. Um, And it gave performers power that they hadn't had before. And I just think that that lends itself to a much healthier industry. You know, before performers might be afraid to speak out about issues that they were having because they didn't want to be blacklisted. They didn't want 
producers, brands to think that they were problematic, um, that they were going to cause drama. And so they would just kind of go with the flow because they didn't want to lose opportunity for work. Well, now that they don't necessarily have to worry about that and they can make money on their own, uh, they have so much more agency over their career. And I just think that that creates like a healthier space for these people to work in. And it's brands have really kind of changed their approach and have recognized the power of the performer and now tend to acquiesce to their requests much more easily. Uh, they, you know, pay them better. Um, we've installed boundary checklists. Um, there's just a lot more respect um, for the performers that I think is very much deserved and, you know, was a long time coming. So if we look at the evolution of the adult industry, and I have to admit to remembering when I um, pulled the first magazine off the top shelf when I was about 13, and oh, how it's changed since then. And used to wait up when I was 16 for five minutes to get the free view at midnight. And now, of course, I imagine now being a, 13 to 15 year old kid where it's just on tap, on demand. You know, there was no embarrassment going into the news agents, get which one of your mates is gonna go and buy the magazine and get ID'd. And, and now it's just everywhere. So how do you think um, the industry has changed and it's affected the youth in the use of pornography? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely an issue. Um, minors being able to access online pornography is certainly a hot topic and um, it comes up a lot. So I think that m what I find is, is lacking is, first of all, sex education, specifically in the United States. It's really bad here. And also like media literacy. Parents, so if you have a child, right? parents don't really know, they, there's no information out there on how to monitor your child's activity on the internet, how to prevent them from accessing certain sites. A lot of these sites have certain like filters um, on them that if you install on your computer or your phone, you can prevent minors from accessing them. There's also ways that you can, you know, I have a friend of mine who has three young daughters and he is able to see everything that they access online. Now, of course, there's always your friend's phone or your friend's computer that you can go to. But um, I think media literacy for parents so that they know how they can protect their children from online porn. Sex education, so kids who are watching online porn have an understanding of what they're seeing and understand that it's a fantasy and it's not sex education is also, I think, important. So I actually had a woman on my podcast named Justine Ang Fonte, who specifically teaches porn literacy to youth. Now, obviously she doesn't show them porn that's illegal and unethical, but she's able to help them navigate this kind of new world with information, understanding of what they're seeing is fantasy, understanding that that is not a guideline on how to be intimate with another person, these kind of complicated issues. So um, I think also just having standard sex education in school is really helpful. If kids can't get answers from school or from their parents, they're naturally going to go to the internet and, and look there. And that is not always the best place to seek those answers. How do you think um, the adult industry has affected and changed masculinity? Are you saying that in a way where men feel less masculine because they compare themselves to male porn stars. They compare themselves to the fantasy, the acts that they see on screen. Like it kind of makes them doubt their own masculinity. Is that, um, is that what it, you mean? It was actually completely unloaded and open, but I like, okay. <laughs> I like that. I definitely like you to go there. Cause I think that sounds really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, look, Men are obsessed with their penis size. They're obsessed with, is it big enough? Is it too small? Is it okay? What do I do with it? You know, that is something that, <clears throat> I mean, I come across this all the time. 
And I think that men see porn and they see these big dicks and they see these extravagant sex scenes, um, wild positions, um, you know, crazy jackhammering. And I think they intrinsically think, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. And, you know, I've interviewed so many women who have said the the sex that you see in porn is not actually the sex that I usually enjoy one-on-one with my partner. And believe it or not, penis size is not as important to women as men think it is. Um, even female performers who work with huge penises all the time say that they prefer an average penis. I can tell you that when I've shot scenes with men with really large penises, those can sometimes be more difficult scenes to shoot because he's so big that um, it can be painful sometimes in certain position for women, and especially if they have to go for a long time. So we might have to take more breaks. We might have to use more lube. They may not want to do it in certain positions because it just goes too deep. So again, porn is a fantasy and one should not measure their penis size or their own abilities by what they see in porn. Is that easier said than done when you look on free internet and you see theirs and then you look down and you see yours (laughs) lamely hanging? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, but here, you know, I'll tell you this. So the reason that men's penises are so large in porn is not just because, you know, Porn in general is just, again, a fantasy, tends to be over the top. It's almost like sometimes can be a caricature of real life. Men's penises need to be bigger for logistical photography reasons. So I need a man's penis to be a certain length so that he can insert it into the vagina. And I still need to see some of the penis. I need to see the insertion and some of the penis not to mention the fact that the performers have to do what's called opening up to camera, right? So if they're just straight on and you got a lot of butt cheek here, you know, you're not seeing anything. They have to kind of like twist themselves in a way to open themselves up to camera, which kind of like forces the penis to like bend slightly. So it needs to be a certain length. So it doesn't like just pop out while you're shooting. So it needs to be able to go in and out, still see the length of the penis, still see the penetration and still be able to open up to camera, especially if the girl has a really big butt, she's got really big butt, there's more flesh, there's more, you know, skin that the penis is disappearing into. And so it can be harder to get that penetration. So there's a lot of like logistical reasons why men's penises need to be so big for porn, not necessarily because it's better. It's just easier to shoot. If anyone was listening to the audio, they need to come and watch the YouTube and see Holly (laughs) doing all the the actions and the hand (laughs) movements. Um, One will take note and remember he he only has a large penis for logistical reasons (laughs) and one must not compare. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And it's important to keep that in mind. Let's look at the sort of business and the um, disruption an evolution of the industry. Because my show is called Disruptors, but it actually used to back in the day, Holly, be called Disruptive Entrepreneur. Because I'm an entrepreneur and I used to only interview entrepreneurs before we went wider. So I always love the business side. That's my most interesting analysis. So, I mean, being an outside non-expert, I remember magazines, I remember Freeview and um, late TV then the internet and only fans and i may have missed a couple of little evolutionary disruptions in the way where's the future of the adult industry going and i know you're in the future aren't you with meta and vr so would love the discussion around that yeah so i uh just kind of recently actually like left all of my regular clients my regular shooting jobs to go full-time with a metaverse startup and we are debuting at the avn show in las vegas in january and um it's called joy city and it is an interactive city where you will be able to not only buy performers content like you can now the regular 2d photos and videos but you will be able to interact with them and experience their content in a much more 
immersive way. And it's accessible through VR, but also just on your regular laptop, on a desktop, you can walk through the space um, without VR goggles. So for people who don't know what a metaverse is, it's kind of like, think of, I guess, like an open world video game. Um, it's like that. So you have, you have an avatar that you choose. You can be whoever you want. You can look however you want and you can walk around in this, uh, city that we've built. We have two neighborhoods right now. And of course we will continue to expand as we continue to bring more people on, but essentially it's a creator platform, kind of like an OnlyFans on steroids, if you will. So each performer will either have their own space or building. Um, and in there, they will be able to sell their content and you will also be able to experience different immersive types of content. Like we do these 3d hologram captures they are called volumetric captures. And so when you're in the space, you have the performer there, they're doing whatever they do and you can walk around them and you can see them from all different angles. Um, performers can also be their own avatars and through like simple motion capture can interact with you in the environment. You can talk to them. They can also have other kinds of events. That's not just adult related because a lot of these performers, and you really saw again, this kind of explode with, with only fans and, and fans feeling connected to the performers as people, not just as, you know, um, adult performers. So a lot of performers are also stand-up comedians, they're musicians, they're dancers, they're artists, they have other interests um, that they like to engage in and fans like to support them in that. So performers can have, you know, not only again, the porn that they're going to sell, right? That's essentially what they do, but they could have shows where they might do stand-up comedy, they might do burlesque dancing, they might do music events, all kinds of like really cool events that you can come in and you can watch and engage with also other people on the platform as well. So there's like a real social connectivity there, which is very, very exciting. And just, you know, with the way that technology is advancing, there's just all kinds of like amazing possibilities, interactive sex toys. You can get like virtual hand jobs from your favorite performers. Um, it's just uh, it's just a really cool and exciting space. So do you think the future of um, the adult industry is interactive and VR? Do you think that's where it's going? I think so. I think so. I mean, I, you know, I think that everybody's kind of headed. I mean, the metaverse is a hot topic right now and it's trending and, and everybody's who understands it's talking about it and everybody who doesn't understand it is asking what it is. But I think, you know, that's that ability to connect with other people in a more immersive space is what, what people are really interested in. I wonder if the way the adult industry has changed has changed the rules in a relationship. So, um, for example, you just said you could get an interactive hand job. I wonder if I said to my wife, I've just had an interactive hand job <laughs> in, <laughs> on VR. I want, I mean, you, you know, she might be all right with me checking out a bit of OnlyFans or a bit of um, online free adult entertainment. But if I told her I'd had an interactive hand job, I, I think I'd be in trouble. <laughs> the li is the line moving and, and, and where does the, do you see what I'm trying to say? You know, um, I mean, that's a discussion between you and your wife, but I understand what you're saying. And that's a, that's a good, that is a good question. I guess it depends on whether or not you want to be open with your wife about that. I mean, I feel like for the most part, you know, we might be attracting more people who don't necessarily have a partner or have, who have a hard time connecting with women. You know, there's a lot of, of men that I speak to who are socially awkward are shy or maybe on the spectrum and, you know, don't have a girlfriend, haven't had a girlfriend and they, you know, they feel accepted and, you know, can obviously get their rocks off with an adult star. So, I mean, I've had a lot of conversations about 
non-monogamy on my podcast that I think have been incredibly interesting. And it's made me look at the idea of monogamy kind of differently, though I am in a monogamous relationship. I'm married. I've been, I've been with him for six and a half years and I have no intention of going out and having sex with other people. We're very happy and comfortable in our relationship, but I've definitely like thought a little bit about it and wondered, you know, what, what is, what is considered cheating? Um, cause some women consider just another man watching porn and, you know, using his own hand, uh, a personally interactive hand job from yourself as cheating. So some men that's the only way they know, get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. So yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's an interesting topic and I, I just, I just see more and more people having open relationships. My parents had an open relationship. They were swingers back in the sixties and seventies, you know, and 50 years later, they're still together. So, um, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if people will be happier if they just change the rules a little bit, but I suppose that's on an individual basis. Well, let's have a brief summary of that discussion because I haven't really thought about this because I'm also in a monogamous relationship with my wife and very happy, but I have seen society change and I have seen the adult industry change and I've seen the way people define relationships change and relationships are more disposable now, aren't they? With swipe, 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 swipe. And they're more interactive now with what you can get in the adult industry, can be very tailored. so let's just go there real quick. You said you're hearing more and more people um, having open relationships. What are people saying and how is that working? And, and how are people who would otherwise be traditional and not want to feel that they're being cheated on open their mind to a new way of having a relationship? So I have found that swingers and people in open relationships tend to have better communication between themselves than a lot of monogamous partners. I think that because they're engaging in sexual activities with other people, it kind of forces this acknowledgement of each other's sexual needs and desires and forces them to establish boundaries that are comfortable for each person. I think that Sometimes when you're in a monogamous relationship, it's just this understanding that, you know, this basic structure, we're together, you're not allowed to have sex with anybody else. You, maybe as time has gone on, we don't have sex that much anymore. I've lost interest. You continue to have interest. You continue to have needs, but we're not even going to discuss that because the option of you fulfilling those needs elsewhere, um, is just something that we're not even going to discuss or is going to come up. So then this person becomes more and more frustrated, feels more isolated and perhaps goes and find fulfills those needs in a dishonest way. And then the other person finds out and then obviously there's a, there's a problem there. So I just wonder if sometimes people were in a situation where they had to acknowledge each other's needs and acknowledge each, that sometimes people's needs are different you know, and it can change over time. And it's okay if your needs in a certain area don't match up. There's also this idea too, that I think sometimes people feel that their partner has to fulfill every single aspect of a relationship, which I don't think is necessarily true for everybody. Like your partner has to be able to fulfill you sexually, um, emotionally, um, you know, and and in intelligently in an intellectual way, um, in a, you know, uh, monetary way, uh, provider way, whatever it may be. And that's a lot to put on one person. So I wonder sometimes if we could acknowledge, okay, this person, you know, is able to provide for me in these areas, but maybe not so much in these areas. So I could fulfill those needs in those areas elsewhere, but that doesn't, you know, create a rift between us. That doesn't mean that this person isn't still significantly valuable to me and is, you know, my partner for life. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I feel sick in the bottom of my stomach 
like just even entertaining the initial thought that someone else is at it with my wife. I, it's just such an emotional block. I, I don't know I could ever... I, I hear you make a lot of good logical arguments. Um, yeah, fuck. <laughs> just hearing you say that and then thinking about my wife having sex with someone else makes me feel sick. <laughs> but why? Are you afraid that she would leave you for that person? Or like, I, I don't know. I oh, personally yeah, if, if you want to that... psychoanalyze me, you can. Our listeners love it when I get the tables turned, so feel free. <laughs> don't, don't be shy. Um, uh, no, but I think sometimes it's, it's interesting to like unpack these feelings around it's intimacy, like, why isn't it? It's, you know, someone doing mm -hmm. things with your wife that's so intimate. And I would feel ashamed yeah. and humiliated and, um, yeah, violated, I suppose. Do you feel that that would be because it means that you're not able to provide for her? Um, I don't want to, I'm going to try and say this in a neutral way. She definitely doesn't have any problem in that department. I hope I didn't come across <laughs> like a braggy. Like, I, I have a sex drive that's, you know, a lot higher than, well, any woman I've wet, met, let alone my wife. So right. I, I know if she was sat here, she would say that there is no problem, both in what he does and the frequency of how he does it. <laughs> I, I could, I'm not bragging, right. I'm just, I, I know that. <laughs> I, I know, no, know that. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think she would want to either, but no, I don't think she would have that issue of not being fully fulfilled. Um, I did, someone told me a story of someone um, who, who is dating her friend and apparently this is a thing, I only learned it recently. He has a micro penis and apparently there is a small percentage of men who have such a small penis they actually can't do anything with it. And this man is one of those and, he, and, he's, and he, um, when he dates women, he dates them emotionally and pays for them and provides but he allows them to have sex with other people because he can't fulfil that. And, and he's kind of become okay with that. And that really fascinated me. Yeah, that is super interesting. I have um, a fan who also has a micro penis, but he kind of takes it in the opposite way where he enjoys um, being humiliated for his small penis. That's like what gets him off and having his wife sleep with other men and watching it, um, you know, the cuckolding fetish. So he's kind of turned that micro penis into enjoying people making fun of his micro penis. Um, so it's interesting how, how that plays out, but yeah, I mean, that, that's such a great example because I mean, it's just, and, and that's an area where I feel so, I really feel for you guys because you can't control how big your penis is and you could be like a wonderful guy with all these great attributes and, you know, just a, would be an incredible husband, boyfriend. And then, you know, you have this like such a small part of your body that then designates like how, whether or not you have relationships, like that must be so awkward to go on a date with a girl and then know that like, you're going to have to reveal the situation to them, which could be embarrassing and could, you know, ultimately end any possibility of a relationship. It's just like, what do you do there? You know, how do you get past that? Um, yeah, wow, I didn't know this was gonna go down this road and a big part of me wants to open this road, but it's gonna go down a whole other road. Um, but may maybe in another life or another time. Um, what I would like to ask, Holly, is um, the gender pay gap. Does it exist in the adult industry? Yes, women, I would say in general, women are paid more than men are though some of the top male performers are definitely being paid the same as um, the women are. But, but overall, yes, women are paid more than men. So you know when a lot of people talk about the gender pay gap and that women are paid less, why do they not yes. reference the adult industry where women are paid more? Uh, I don't know, because I guess that would be counteractive to everybody's attempt to make all women in the adult industry victims and 
painted as a misogynistic industry that's destroying lives. And I guess you don't think it is that. So one of my biggest issues with people um, painting all women in the adult industry as victims is that I find that automatic jump to that conclusion to be kind of misogynistic in itself. Because when you say that, you suggest that women um, have no agency over their career, their choices, um, that they couldn't possibly have decided to enter the adult industry because it was something that interested them. They had to have been forced in there by like a pimp boyfriend or agent. Um, and that ultimately like women couldn't possibly enjoy sex and exhibitionism. So I think that, you know, painting all women in the industry as victims, um, is just like naive and doesn't do women any justice at all. Now, I mean, you know, let's be realistic. There are women and men in the industry, you know, who probably aren't best suited to be here. The porn industry is not for everybody. And there's several reasons for that. Um, but there's a lot of women who really enjoy their jobs. Like if you talk to someone like Angela White, who's probably one of the biggest porn stars out there, um, you, if you come away from a conversation with her, you will have absolutely no doubt in your mind that this woman is very suited for her job. She loves what she does. She's incredibly intelligent. She's really built a brand around it. And I can tell you from working with her many times, there is an energy in her when she gets into the scene that is like unmistakable. It's like she loves it. She loves having sex. She loves having sex in front of the camera. And that's just so abundantly clear. Um, and, you know, it's kind of part of the reason that I started my podcast was I wanted people to really get to see another side of performers and allow them in their own words to justify why they're in the industry and, you know, talk about what it is about the industry that they love. And it's just, um, I think also too, with the way that things have changed recently, the porn industry is a much better place to work in now than it was even like a decade ago because of these personal content platforms like OnlyFans. Performers have so much more agency over their career. They have so much more control and there's so much less instances of women getting involved in situations that they end up regretting later. And there's also more information out there. So if you want to get into the adult industry, you can do research, you can talk to other performers, you can watch podcast interviews and, and find out more information so you can come in with an educated decision. I think that's the most important thing is to come into the porn industry, having done your research, understanding what you're getting into, knowing what the upsides are, knowing what the downsides are and making an educated decision on, um, you know, becoming a porn star. So I've seen a couple of Netflix documentaries, which I haven't watched yet, about how um, adult stars have really struggled transitioning out of the career and moving on afterwards. I've interviewed a lot of very successful sports people who struggle you know, they're a famous professional footballer at the top of their game and then they're retired and what, what have they got left? Or people leave the military into civilian life and it's, they, they almost get shell-shocked. Is that a thing in the adult business? And what do people do wrong? And what tips can you give that they might do right moving into the, the next stage of their career? Um, it's definitely an issue. Um, and, you know, obviously stigma is the biggest part of it. Uh, there's, there was actually a case in Oregon. The woman's name is Nicole and her last name is escaping me, but essentially she came into the adult industry for about a year, did a handful of scenes, decided it wasn't for her left and went to nursing school. Well, they found out at her nursing school that she had been a porn star and she essentially got kind of bullied and pushed out of the program for having been a porn star for like I said, a short period of time. And she actually fought back and uh, she sued them and she won for discrimination because it's like, the thing, this is the thing that frustrates me the most, right? You see, you have all these porn naysayers who are like, get a real job, get out of the porn industry. That's not a real job. Go get a real job. And then people are like, okay. And they leave at the porn industry and they try to get a real job. And then like nobody 
we'll give them a real job or allow them to have a job. It's, it's, it's crazy. There was another, um, same thing. It's interesting. Uh, so a lot of porn stars go into nursing or real estate, like no joke. Um, I don't know why, but there was another male porn star who was a nurse and, uh, somebody recognized him and then he got fired because the hospital felt like they were compromised because of somebody decided that, you know, they were uncomfortable with someone who'd been a porn star that it, it would fall on them. Like porn stars are criminals and sexual deviants and, um, which is, you know, absolutely insane. Like they're regular law abiding citizens, like the rest of us, they pay their fucking taxes and a lot of them as small business owners and, um, they're good people. So the stigma is, is a huge, a huge part of what makes it so difficult to transition out. So my advice would be, I will say though, especially again, in this day and age where you can, you know, create your own content and, um, you know, pretty much be your own small business owner is you learn a lot about being a small business owner as a porn star. You're essentially like a mini entrepreneur. Um, you're an independent contractor. And so there's a lot of things that you can learn about business, which is really valuable. And I would say, save your money. You know, you could make a lot of money in the adult industry in a short amount of time. Do not blow it on handbags and expensive cars, save your money, invest it wisely, um, have that cushion for you. If you want to make that kind of transition, I will also say that, you know, a lot of these you know, now that we have influencers there and the streaming platforms like YouTube and Twitch, there's been a lot of performers who have been able to make a transition to, you know, still being a media personality. They've acquired a lot of fans, um, but they no longer are doing sex acts. Sasha Gray is a great example. She, you know, moved on from doing porn. She no longer does porn, but she's a very successful Twitch streamer. So I think that nowadays with technology, and people's ability to be their own entrepreneur in so many different areas. I think it's, it's easier for performers to transition out of the industry, but it still, it still comes with its complications. We like to do a quick fire round on disruptors. Um, just get the pace up before we finish. 15, if you want to go into detail, maybe 30 second answers, that kind of flow, are you ready? Yeah, let's hope my internet doesn't cut out. <laughs> <laughs> Holly, are adult stars misunderstood? Absolutely. Absolutely misunderstood. They're human beings like you and I. And how do people misunderstand them, judge them, and what do they not know about them that you know? Uh, I think that people see adult performers, as I mentioned before, as like sexual deviants and criminals and somehow you know, not people who can be, I don't know, who don't, who can't live like regular lives or be parents or be friends or be wives or husbands. Um, adult stars can do all of those things. What is the perfect penis size? <laughs> the perfect penis size is your penis size. <laughs> Right, I'm short in cutting this for my wife and I'm sending it back to her. But I, I, you've done a video on this, Holly. I know you have. Um, what is the perfect... How many times did you watch that? <laughs> I haven't yet, but because mine is the perfect size, so I don't need to watch it. Um, of course. But in light of what we said before about the male issues and comparing to the, you know, larger than life adult, for logistical purposes, penis size. What is the mm. perfect penis size, Holly? I, I would say the perfect penis size is maybe like anywhere between six and seven inches would be good. Maybe on the lower end, six, six and a half. The average male penis size is five and a half. So I think maybe just like a smidgen bigger, but I would be happy to, I can work with a five and a half inch penis as well. Holly, do adult stars have daddy issues? Who doesn't have daddy issues? <laughs> I mean, sure. I know that, you know, some of them definitely do. I know some that have wonderful relationships with their fathers. So it, it's different. 
What's a common daddy issue with an adult star that you see? Probably a sense of abandonment. I think that's probably most people's daddy issue is feeling unloved. Andrew Tate says OnlyFans is a terrible way to make a living. What does Holly Randall think? Andrew Tate says that OnlyFans is a holy, is a horrible way to make a living. Um, I, I mean, I don't know why he says that. I don't know anything about him, but I would say that it depends on the person. You know, like I've said before, the adult industry is not for everybody. You need to make sure that you feel comfortable with having sex on camera, that you are okay with everybody that you know, seeing you naked, knowing what you do for a living um, and understanding, you know, the stigma that might follow it. If all of, if you've considered all of these things and they're okay to you, it can be a great way to make a living because it really is a way for you to do your own thing on your own time and own all of the content that you produce and you are beholden to nobody. Holly, what's the best thing about being in the adult business? The best thing about being in the adult industry, I think is the people. I, you know, I love porn stars. They are the coolest, funnest, most interesting, most chill people. I've shot you know, everything from Playboy centerfolds to fashion models. I've even worked with some celebrities and hands down porn stars are my favorite people to work with. They're just like really enjoyable and, um, just friendly and just, you know, I think there's something about being the black sheep of the entertainment industry that prevents this like kind of massive sense of ego that you get from some other people in the entertainment industry. And they're just like, they're just my favorite people in the world. Holly, what's the worst thing about the adult business? The worst thing about the adult industry is the stigma. The fact that sometimes banks will close down your account because they find out what you do for a living. They consider you a high risk category, um, which is kind of like putting you in the same um, category as like an arms dealer uh, or a drug dealer, which is absolutely insane. What we do is legal. Um, we are responsible people. We pay our taxes. We're not breaking any laws and um, we deserve the same rights as every other worker. Tell us about your podcast, Holly, and where we can find you and follow you and the discussions you have and where we should go next. So you can find my podcast. Um, it's called Holly Randall Unfiltered. It's on all podcast platforms, um, but I also have a YouTube channel and I do interviews once a week. And I interview obviously, you know, the top adult stars, but I also interview directors. I interview um, journalists, uh, sex therapists, doctors. I've had all kinds of different people on. Everybody has to have some kind of connection to sex in some way, um, but it is pretty varied. And um, yeah, I'm very proud of it. And you will, you're in for some eye-opening and very unexpected conversations. And that's what I love so much about my show. Holly, this has been fun and a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for giving us your hour. Uh, very grateful. Thank you. Well, I don't even know what to say. I'd like to hear what you say. What did you think about that insane conversation? Before you go, make sure you catch another Disruptors interview. You can watch it here. Before you get out of here, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.